Welcome to the Engineering Room. We publish these conversations at the end of each month on the Continuous Delivery Channel. So subscribe, and if you enjoy the content today, do hit like. Um, and join the conversation in the chat below the video if you find any of the topics that we talk about uh, interesting today. My guest is another old friend. We first met at some slightly strange DevOps event held at a, a restaurant in London where the menu was kind of an augmented reality thing that projected images of the, the dinner onto your plate. Uh, later, we met at the first Pipeline Conference, a conference dedicated to continuous delivery that he helped to organize at then and for several years to come. He's an author of several very good books and co-author of one of what I think is one of the most significant books in our discipline to have been published over the last few years, Team Topologies. He's been recognized by Tech Beacon as one of the top 100 people to follow in DevOps. He's head of consulting at Conflux and specializes in continuous delivery, operability, and organizational dynamics for modern software systems, and is an expert in helping teams to do a better job. Please welcome to the channel and to the engineering room, Matt Skelton. Sorry, Matthew Skelton. Good to be here. Thanks, Dave. It's a pleasure. Uh, and thanks, thanks for joining us today. Um, uh, it's an interesting place to where to start. I, I, I know that your background is in helping organizations, uh, in recent years anyway, in helping organizations to do a better job of the kind of things that I would classify as software engineering and um, you know, advising them uh, on that in the broad because this is a multifaceted, multidimensional thing, um, particularly with team topologies um you know this is really talking at the level of ceos and ctos rather than you mm -hmm. know individual developers on the ground very much this is strategic this is the stuff that we need to get right in order to put organizations in a in in a, a position to do a better job it's a tool that we can use so if we're working at that kind of scale and thinking in those sorts of terms where do we start? What are the things that we need to get right? That's a great question. And and just as a, as an aside, you're right. The 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 kind of conversations that we have with uh, with customers and, and and potential customers are have increasingly switched to it's the CEO, the CEO of the company. At least it's the CTO if it's a larger company or CTO of a division if it's a huge company. But yeah, I mean, we get CTOs who've read the book and go. I want some of this. Thank you very much, and and and, and approaches. So it, it's been. Um, I'm so Manuel and I, my, so my co-author Manuel Paish and I are, are super grateful, really, for all of the hard work that the the publishers, IT Revolution, put <clears throat> into getting the book into a really really good shape at the right time. Uh, because without without their help, it it it, it wouldn't have wouldn't have landed uh, as well as it obviously has done. But we're really happy that it's, it's helping lots of organisations to rethink how they approach. Uh, software engineering and and and, and the, the the building and running of software enriched services as we call them now because often we're building services which have a software part to them but it's not entirely software for example applying for a passport somebody has might have to go into might have to go online yes but they might have to go into a passport office sometimes if if they're if they're in a particular uh, category or whatever they might there might be a part of this service which is which is which is physical and then eventually you get your passport through the door delivered to you so there's that physical part as well and there's a software bit in the middle so we tend to talk about now software enriched services where software is doing some kind of enrichment of, of something else that's happening um but yeah certainly ceos are, are seeing the team to properties patterns as, as part of the part of the approach part of the mindset that they that they want to adopt to be successful and that that's been that's been really great to see. I think what um, I think what what the what the adoption of Teen to Pod or, or, or what, what the success of, of this kind of Teen to Pod's book uh, um, and, and and ideas indicates is a recognition that this job, this activity of software engineering or building these software and rich systems is not just writing code it's not just it's not just about heads down typing some stuff out and then putting that software out the door there's a kind of an ecosystem of things that are involved around that 
We know from the book Acts, uh, well, from, we know from research from Google uh, and other people that psychological safety is, is absolutely crucial to, to make this stuff happen at scale and at pace. If we we're going, if we're doing small scale, really slowly, maybe you don't need so much psychological safety because there isn't so much that can go wrong. If we're going potentially large scale or at least very quickly, multiple changes a day, which obviously we can do thanks to things like continuous delivery. We know how to do that stuff, right? This is CD is absolutely foundational for any of this stuff to happen. Um, so we've got the patterns for, for going quickly, safely, and repeatedly. If we're doing this, there's a bunch of these other things that come into play. It, it's the team interactions that we talk about in, in team topologies. It's clarity of kind of team purpose, but there's all the stuff around kind of domain-driven design, like clarity of business purpose and business mission and finding a, sort of de-untangling these different concepts. The psychological safety I've just mentioned. But how do we get learning across these different teams? If these teams are now somewhat separate and decoupled, how do we make sure we're spreading awareness and learning across these teams? Um, there's a whole set of social practices or, or, or semi-technical practices, maybe things like writing, um, writing, uh, kind of um, doing some kind of technical writing. That could be an article, it could be a blog post, it could be some technical documentation. That is absolutely that's the, a key part of success to enable people to self-serve from what we call a platform, Teams Body's platform. That, that, that the, the quality of the documentation there need, needs to be first class and so on and so on. And it's this ensemble of, of different kinds of practices, different kinds of things that need to come together to make software delivery at scale and at pace actually viable and sustainable in the long term. We need to have a, a solid foundation of technical practices, but that is not enough. It, it, we need to combine that and mix it in with a bunch of other things too. Um, and I think that's, for me, that's super interesting. Like I like to, I, I, I like, I've been involved in a lot of this stuff for, for, for many, many years. And I, I like to be involved in it. I, I like the, I like thinking about the relationships between practices, I think. I've just realized that. I think that's that's one of the things that I actually I, I like is think like thinking about the relationship between continuous delivery and teams bodies, for example. And I actually wrote an article last year or early this year, I think, uh, about exactly that. But thinking it through, going, oh, yeah, how does that relate to that? This kind of thinking through how these different practices relate and and, and in what context they can work or might not work, or, or you might need more of one or, or, or less of one or something like that. And that's that's obviously because I like doing it. That's what I, that's what I've. Uh, that's what I've helped to build in in in, in my company, Conflux, and and what we're helping our customers with. It, for me, it's a super interesting space because it's a, it's a, about kind of it starts to explore sort of complexity, complex systems, complex adaptive systems in a Kinevin sense, um, where you've got multiple agents interacting, and therefore the 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 the, the, the behavior of the system is, is non predictable, or, or rather is is non linear and has 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 uh, apparently kind of unexpected outcomes and so on. Um, and let, let, I, I'd like to try and put some words into your mouth and see if I yeah. see if I'm I'm understanding. I, I, I'm sure I'm, I'm sure that we are well aligned on this. But I, I think that what you're saying is exactly right. So the way that I uh, the way that I've kind of approached the <clears throat> the kind of holistic nature, realistically, of good software development mm. um, that you're talking about is in my consultancy. I talk to clients about you know you've got to be excellent at the tech. You've got to be excellent at the, the culture, and you've got to be excellent at kind of you know the organisational um, design, for, for want of a better term. And uh, these pieces don't work. You, you, being good at any one of them is not good enough. You, you, you've got to be good at all of them to do certainly great work. Uh, and optimising in, in any one place is not going to fix the problem. So you've got to figure out ways of, of doing that. And I think. Would you agree that that's that's the kind of thing that you're talking about? Yes, yeah, no, I would, and um, I think there's a thing beyond that as well, which is um, uh, is understanding is it, it's uh, it's that high level of understanding about what we're doing and why. So is that shuhari? That's the re bit, or it's, at least it's the ha bit of shuhari. Um, so we understand what we're doing and why, and understand how these practices relate. So we know that actually, hey, if we're in theory, the, in theory, this is like ideal practice over here. 
and there's some other practice over here, but actually we found ourselves in a, in, in a, a novel situation where actually we need to change our practice in one area because actually we've found uh, a challenge that means that we, we need to adapt but we're happy yeah. to adapt precisely because we understand the underlying principles and 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 i mean this is kind of the same in any kind of non-trivial kind of operating context but um it really does start to have a massive difference when i think it's important now 2022 and beyond software is now so pervasive yeah it's it, it, it's we are encoding the business or organizational intent in so many different dimensions now if you go back 15 20 years when some of the um you know the software was a thing that you installed on a machine it was microsoft word it was a, it was a it was a a video game it was whatever you know that's that's a discrete thing and it doesn't really affect your life particularly help it's a tool to help you do something um and yes there's there's obviously there's there's, there's COBOL banking applications things like that but but Software is, is so all pervasive now that we do need to start, we really start taking seriously the sustainability of, of ongoing software development across these multiple different areas, because this is now life and death in many cases. Mm -hmm. It's life and death for the, for the uh, brain imaging machines I know you've worked with. Yeah. It's life and death for things like um, for social security. If, someone, if, if a government service uh, somehow does something wrong or, 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 or there's an error with a payment to someone on the low income, they might literally freeze to death yes. in their house because that payment didn't come through. This is literally life and death now for, 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 for more and more and more software, which wasn't true in the past. And so we, we, I really think as, a, as an engineer, I really think that this, this, is, this is something that we really, really need to take seriously. How do we make sure that our approach to the, the delivery and operation of of software enriched services is sustainable is understandable by the people who are working on it um and is kind of as safe and and error free as we can make it because these are now really important uh, areas of, of of people's lives that we're working in you're and, hitting and we, so many of them. my you're hitting so many of my hot buttons is i'm not <laughs> not quite sure which which thread to follow <laughs> so i, I want to pull i want to pull back to the let's 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 pick one i want to pull back to the start uh, I, one of the books one of the most influential books that i've read for a very very long time outside of software was a, a book by david deutsch the physicist called uh, the beginning of Inf infinity in which is is really a book on the philosophy of science and one of the things that you said re you know reminded me very strongly of ideas that i picked up from that he talks about science as being deeply about finding what he calls good explanations and so a good explanation you know you can't take anything away or need to add anything for it to be correct uh, and if you take something away, you're going to break the explanation. And it, it fits all of the facts, all of the evidence that we have. And I, I think that what you were saying before about being able to do a good job and understand the reasons why is, is related to that. We need good explanations for the reasons that we choose to do continuous delivery or test stream development or team topologies mm. and you know dividing out your platform team to as yeah. a as a product inside the organization or how whatever else you want to talk about we need reasons why that matters rather than just saying i'm going to adopt this framework because everybody else is adopting this framework and i think that's really important and i think that's a step more in the direction of engineering rather than just fashion which is which is mm. the, the way quite a lot mm. of our industry works the, the stuff yeah. that you're saying about that you know the importance of software in the world is just self-evident i mean i i mean i i one of the things that, that that it seems to me that during the course of my career really we kind of moved from really just automating the processes that were there before to now driving the business really yeah. you know in terms of you know so if these days, if software isn't absolutely core to the delivery of your business function, you're in a fairly unusual business. You know, it's 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 kind of and in many fields of life, as you say, life threatening as a result. And so I think, you know, the ideas of us 
I'm going to sound like a grumpy old man now, but growing up a little bit and starting to be a little bit more professional in our approach Mm. and really starting to eliminate the stuff that really is a dumb idea in bad is, is, um, Mm. is an important one. And, you know, the, 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 this kind of holistic thing is, it it seems to me that the, the, the complex adaptive systems that we inhabit, um, just seem to be a function of doing this at any kind of scale beyond the trivial. You know, if you've got a couple of mates that are working together in a shed somewhere or, or, or online these days on something, that might be different. But if it's much bigger than that, th- there's more to it. There's 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 more yeah. organisation, more thought about the communication involved and so on, which is, I, I think, at the core of that intersection that you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, there's one example we can take from from teams board. I mean, there's loads of examples from teams board we could take, but one example in particular is is the use of uh, the, the idea of using team cognitive load to help mm-hmm. with yeah. architectural decisions and, and and sizing decisions and things. Because I'm, I think it's pretty fair to say before teams bodies were probably, or before we started talking about these ideas, the the idea of team cognitive load basically didn't exist inside inside the software community. Yes, there are definitely some people talking about it for sure, and you you, you probably talked about it yourself, and people yeah. like Daniel Turles North and people, but it, it wasn't very common at all. Uh, interestingly, round about the same time as we started talking about team cognitive load, uh, if you look at if you do Google Google is it a Google phrase search anyway, where you look for when a phrase was used, you actually see team cognitive load appearing in the clinical and healthcare sectors at pretty much exactly the same time, around about 2018. Yeah. Because they, you know, around about then you, you've got the, there's a realization in the clinical and health sector that so nothing to do with software, nothing to do with software, really. You've got people, you've got situations where you need an anesthetist, a surgeon, a nurse, a specialist, doctor, a pallet, I don't know, another kind of care provider, whatever. And uh, perhaps like an x-ray technician, but actually, someone's got a really, they've got a patient who's got a really complicated problem. And that team needs to be there without handoffs to look after that person for a decent period of time. I mean, these days, perhaps they would have COVID as well as a car crash, um, broken bones and whatever. Mm. Um, um, and so in the medical and clinical sector, people started thinking about things like team cognitive load. What would it what would it take for us to be able to own something like that end to end? And therefore, how do we deal with things like um, can we consume X-rays as a service, if you like, yeah. from from the X-ray team? And, and what does that mean? And, and all this kind of stuff. So it's not really about fast flow there, which teams bodies really thinks about fast flow of, of software changes. But in that kind, the clinical context, it's about end to end ownership and avoiding handoffs because in a clinical context every time a patient is handed off to another team their chance of dying increases by something like 12 percent i mean it's in certain situations it's actually life and death so it's really interesting to see that kind of concept appearing in parallel in clinical and and healthcare settings but i think there's, there's a reason behind that which i think is a general awareness of of um uh, th- th- there's a need to think outside of very, very, uh, very constrained disciplines and think about things like long term and and um, uh, uh, mix, uh, 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 bridging um, skills boundaries by having these kind of cross discipline teams. And that in many different disciplines, w- we're working in complex adaptive systems and we need to yeah. find ways of working with in that situation. Yeah, I, 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 absolutely. Uh, and I. I as you were describing that, that you know, there's an, another another similar kind of more structured team management thing on a smaller scale is the um, cockpit resource management approach of uh, airline pilots, and you know they learn lessons from accidents and so on about what works and what doesn't in terms of managing the load on the on the on the pilots and the team to be able to to to, to do these sorts of things. One of the things I, I, I'm I'm never quite sure whether this is just a function of me being a a, a, a technology nerd and only thinking in you know, one way about things or whether this is a deeper idea. But one of the things that it seems relevant to me in this, and I think you kind of touched on and alluded to in some of the things that you've already said before, is is that actually, you know, what we're talking about is that, you know, the, the, the worlds that we inhabit are information systems too. And we are, you know, we are experts in dealing with information systems. And so ideas like coupling and concurrency and 
you know, communication strategies that we think about in technical terms are often equally applicable in um, in human organizational terms and dealing with those complex adaptive systems. And it seemed, you know, it's certainly the way that I manage to kind of process and understand, you know, organizations and, and the world as I see it in those terms sometimes. And, and, and one of the things that, you know, um, so, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of self-advertising. Uh, I, I, I wrote a, a, a how to, a how to guide on, um, on you know how to organize structure of teams largely based on the stuff that you know you and Manuel write write about and some of my ideas that kind of talks about some of those things and how that works I'll, I'll put a link to it for people in the in below but but that but that kind of thinking in those sorts of terms worrying about the coupling between a team as well as the coupling between the top software they are deeply closely related more so than I think than we take note of when we talk about Conway's law, which is kind of the, the shorthand version of that. And th that's part of this holistic problem solving. If you don't get those sorts of, manage those couplings, you get the same kind of contention problems and latency problems in organizations that you see in software if you get those things wrong. And I don't Indeed. know whether that's just me yeah. being overly nerdy, but it's the way no, that I No, I don't think it. so. I don't think so. So I had a realization. In fact, I, I was in I was in a I was in a, uh, a kind of community Slack channel this morning because I had the realization. I think last week uh, I was reading a critique. Well, actually, it's not a critique. It was a, an extremely critical, like negatively critical article on on team topologies, coming from uh, a particular perspective involved in large scale software development. Um, and, and what I realized is that I think there's two, there's at least two different mindsets at work when people think about the problem of software delivery or, or software engineering. And the first mindset I'd characterize as kind of, Hey, we're building a machine to deliver software. And it assumes that this is going to be quite mechanistic. We can turn a handle and software comes out the end, like you put sausage meat in and turn a handle and sausages come out. Um, and some people have that fun. I mean, if you characterize like that, they would say, no, 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 no. I know it's more complicated than that. But fundamentally, they think it's a machine. And what we're trying to do is to create a machine that can work really, really well. Yeah, that's one mindset. And some of the approaches to large scale software delivery effectively take that mindset. They think, oh, what we need to do is build a more effective machine, bring in more or more, either more or fewer uh, external influences, depending on, on which of the large scale approaches you're looking at. Um, but fundamentally, they still think it, it's a mechanism. Yeah. And contrast that with approaches like team topologies, like um, if you if, if you're really honest, like the original kind of agile, um, uh, agile manifesto people yeah uh, then th th this group over here effectively is thinking about um encouraging and nurturing an ecosystem yes. to help good software emerge yes and these are radically different in terms of mindset yes. is it a mechanism or are we trying to nurture an ecosystem yeah and for me it's the nurturing the ecosystem which is where we need to be because because it, it for anything for anything um, more interesting than quite specialized problems, then when we're building software, we are helping an ecosystem to emerge. We are not, if, if we assume we're trying to build a machine or we're trying to create a, a mechanism, we're, we're going to fail because, because that is not the nature of, of what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Working ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I would have been slight. I would have used slightly harsher language than you <laughs> in differentiating between those two. I would have said that one of those works and one of them doesn't, <laughs> which I think is a, ge a good generalization. I, 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 I think that's down to one of the, uh, one of the 
deep misunderstandings of what it is that we do. And I think it's framing software development as a production problem. And I don't think that we ever have a production problem. And I think it's just misrepresenting and misunderstanding fundamentally what engineering is about in, dis in, in other disciplines. Engineering isn't the operation of a production line. Engineering is creating the production line in the first place. And that's the innovative part. Um, we don't have we do, we don't have a production line problem because we can reproduce the, the the fruits of our labor for essentially zero cost. We can just clone the sequence of bytes that represents our system, and there's no cost to that. So our problem is all about the discovery and the problem solving. It's all about all about that ability to explore, learn, and adapt based on those kinds of models that we were talking about earlier to figure out what's our best guess right now, because we're, we're probably not going to be right at any point. And, and that's another one of those deep differences between those two communities, it seems to me. There seems to be an assumption in one group of people that you can understand the problem well enough to know what all of the steps are going to be. And there's a, an assumption in the other group of people, us, that we're going to start off assuming that some of our steps are going to be wrong, but we want to learn really fast where they're wrong and fix them. Mm. And those are deeply different. But the second way is really how science works. And so I think we've got the trump card on our side. Well, it's it's not just science, right? So if you read the um, if you read books like um, you know the, some of the Richard Dawkins classics, like mm -hmm. Blind Watchmaker, and, and and some of the more recent books around how evolution actually works so there's a book called oh am i going to have it on my bookshelf yes it's called the origin of wealth uh it's the very end book it's hang on i need to get my hand in the right place ah, i can't do it i can't do it in reverse i can't do it in reverse it's about there that one it's blue now, i'll try and find a picture of it <laughs> my book's actually not about the origin of wealth it, it's mistitled and there's 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 lots of flaws in the book but the book does talk about evolution as a yeah. mechanism as a fundamental mechanism ah. not, not 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 just for dna and, and organisms but yeah. just fundamentally and and uh you know one of the fundamental fundamental mechanisms there is 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 stepwise step by step yeah. exploration of a solution landscape a potential solution landscape and it has to be step by step or it, it's it's smallish steps and the yeah. larger steps tend not to work yes because you 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 you're going, you, you you're not fit enough for that particular part of the landscape and so just fundamentally in terms of um a, a whole mindset and an almost philosophy behind an approach to exploring um kind of software engineering needs to be evolutionary but it needs to be evolutionary precisely because when we code when we write code that is literally encoding the mm -hmm. intent of the organization that we're working in yeah and if and if we if we can't explore the intent then what we code is not going to match that intent and therefore is always going to be wrong and so that that's, that speaks to what you said. The, the, the a huge part of the challenge is exploring the 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 the, the problem space of like the intent of the organisation and get, getting getting clarity on that. The coding part is it's not that it's easy, but it, it's hard to get the coding part right if we can't understand the intent and 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 the the um, the uh, if we can't if we if we can't explore that stuff very close to when we're writing the code, it, it becomes an impossible task. Uh, it, it, the, the, this idea that we just we've got a sausage machine, we just need to get more people typing more quickly. It fundamentally misunderstands. It, it's not even that it misunderstands software engineering. It, it, it misunderstands software engineering, but it misunderstands the nature of what code is as well. Yes, uh, it's fundamentally it's so much waste in that kind of space with, with these approaches that think it's a sausage machine. It, it, they're, they're, they're in the wrong galaxy. They're, they're in a completely separate part of the universe to where they need to be if they're going to have success. Yes, ab absolutely, and 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 what you said about evolution is something that I, you know, you know I, I've I've thought about for a very long time. It, I, I think evolution's misunderstood when you just think about it in terms of DNA. Evolution is an information 
theory yeah. really it's probably yeah. the, it's probably the strongest information theory it's the way that information works and the ideas of having sort of replicators whatever their notion Dawkins talks about I can't remember which book it is uh, but uh, but but memes as another mm. uh, you know uh, vector for um, evolution to take place in but but I I think it's very very deeply I think that doing a good job of software development is about trying to establish it as a process of directed evolution. We're trying to prod and poke the system in ways that steer it towards the outcome that we'd like to see. And we don't, we can't do that with deep precision because evolution's tricky and sneaky and, and, you know, we'll find little ways of squirting out in different ways and finding bugs and mistakes. And so we, we, we nurture our software towards some, guide it towards some destination that makes sense to us and exactly and, and, and we're working in a particular context we're working in a particular technology context right now yeah. you know a few years ago we've been working with some java version and maybe a bit of dot net now we're working with something completely different we're working with a serverless and and and, and gone as well um that environment is, is itself changing and is changing more and more quickly there are many more different databases to choose from many there's, there's a new javascript language every 14 seconds now is that right <laughs> anyway whatever <laughs> a, a new javascript framework it's something like that um and and so the approach that we take to 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 building and running software needs to needs to be needs to admit needs to be realistic that the environment itself in which in which this stuff is going to run is also changing and will change and therefore the software that we've built will need to change in the future guess what yeah. even if the requirements stay the same yeah. even if it's still the same process to apply for a passport the nature of where we run that code the nature of the browser that people use that whole bunch of things are going to change and therefore the way in which we build that software, the way in which we the way in which we set up our social ecosystem to build and nurture that software needs to take that into account. We're not yeah. just building something which then gets burnt onto a DVD or CD and then that's done. It's the, this stuff is never done and we need to, the, the, there are too many organizations think that it's about getting things done. No, yes. it, it should be about continuous exploration of the organizational intent and the, 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 the environment in which this code is running so that we can continue to match the intent with with this coded version of that intent which is what yeah. we call software it's, it's it's one of the one of the revelations that i had i think it was last year actually was i i, I either kent beck is a genius and foresaw all of this or he had a happy accident with the subtitle of his book embrace change <laughs> because because it's about embracing change but in a deep and fundamental way that touches on everything that we do it's so 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 I I think he's probably a genius, but yeah. <laughs> but, but uh, it really is about taking change as a fundamental of what we do, and in that world we've got to be able to you know my, my thing in terms of you know what modern software engineering is about is that we've got to therefore optimize for learning continuously in this dynamic you know mishmash of environment software social you know interactions and so on and um and so optimize for learning to be able to keep on top of that and optimize to manage the complexity so we can survive it uh, and yeah. i'm increasingly of the mind that one of the tools to do that in terms of I, I think i think our industry would be in a much better shape if we if we could possibly agree to adopt the idea that the ability to change your software is the, is the defining characteristic of its quality. Mm -hmm. So the ability to change it. There are lots of other things that matter, <laughs> but if you can change it, you can change it to have those other things. You can change it mm -hmm. to be more secure, more resilient, faster, you know, nicer to use. You can do all of those things as long as you can keep changing it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so ideas like modularity and cohesion, separation of concerns, uh, deeply at the level, at the technical level, but also at the organizational level. You need modular, cohesive organizations. Mm -hmm. You need teams that can, you know, with a good, you know, that are organized in a way with a good separation of concerns so that you can have your stream aligned teams focus on the value for the organization and manage the cognitive load in the team in a way with supporting teams that help them to to do that yeah it's, it's an example of it's an example of where the, the the patterns for success 
so what, if if you if 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 a person or an organization uh, takes on board this mindset of we need to be able to change things with minimal friction yeah and that changes that, that is, is is a really important property of our, of our software and we're working in this changing internal and external ecosystem and we need to as you said like be able to learn quickly about mm -hmm. all sorts of different stuff how how it works in production or or what these what these new um if you like requirements or, or business intent is find a way to learn really quickly about all of this stuff if you've got that mindset um many things in this space look really strange yes <laughs> like for example hey it's actually better for us not to have a single database it's yeah. actually better for us to have multiple separate databases and then there's some yes. kind of event event source or event based uh, sort of synchronization if you like between them somehow or we've got messaging but if you were to speak to someone i mean certainly when i was studying and 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 and, and in early in my career with software the idea of multiple databases was like an anathema like you you you'd, yeah. you'd be, be shown out of the building you you have a single database and it's probably oracle because that's <laughs> the one to use yeah and and it's an example of where um where the patterns that look suitable for one operating context might look completely different from the patterns in a very different operating context. And you can't necessarily go immediately from one to the other. The organization has to go on a journey to build organizational awareness and organizational intelligence to get from, a, let's say, a relatively simple way of operating into a way of operating which, which acknowledges, at the very least, maybe even celebrates the kind of complexity and, and, and the, 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 the ecosystem aspect. You can't just go from one to the other and and some some people who maybe their background is very traditional or they've not experienced this ecosystem way of thinking for that you know maybe they're coming from like a project management background or they're coming from a very traditional architecture background or whatever they 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 look at some of these new some of these the patterns aren't new but anyway they look at some of the patterns that are are, are, are recently emerged and and and, and are, are are increasingly popular, like team topologies and what have you. And they look at them and they go, this seems crazy. Like, this seems really baffling. I can't understand why you would yeah. do that. And and, and they, they get, because it's so alien, because, because the reason it's alien is because it's actually acknowledging an operating context, which is very different from the one that they're, they're familiar with. An operating context that is relatively predictable and straightforward. So in Kinevin terms, like it's simple or clear, I think it's called now, mm -hmm. uh, or, or complicated. So whereby you might add some expertise in there, and, and but it's still quite mechanistic. Mm -hmm. That kind of general mechanistic approach, which is, uh, you know, we've inherited from Taylorism and all this kind of stuff. Um, the, the assumption that it's just about a sausage machine. The patterns that work in here are, are potentially very, very different from the patterns that work in, in this in, in an environment, which is where we acknowledge the the complexity and and the the adaptiveness and the need for adaptiveness and, and that's a real challenge for lots of organizations because they've got many many people in there who think they're doing the right thing yeah by mm -hmm. trying to project manage stuff or by trying to uh fix an end date or by trying yes. whatever it is that and, and in a particular operating context that might work yeah but we're not most organizations are no longer in that kind of operating context and the kind of software building is not that kind of software. It's not, you know, if, if I don't know, I've got an old, I don't know, I've got an old mobile phone here, right? This doesn't work. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> um, arguably, writing the software for something like this, which is, which is substantially disconnected, it doesn't have internet, right? It's substantially disconnected from, from, from other actors in the world via, via yeah. information networks. Arguably, you can kind of get a group of experts who can come together and build a set of software for that thing, which can get deployed onto it, and which is basically going to work in that context. Yeah. That's largely because it's kind of discrete. It's a closed system. It, it doesn't get influenced by other actors in this kind of information network. The increasingly, software is not like that now. Increasingly, software is need, need to be able to respond to what's going on in the wider world. And it's impossible to predict that ahead of time. E e to, even, uh, so, 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 so uh, again, too many things to unpick, <laughs> but 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 even then, e even even in those circumstances, my 
my experience, my observation is that even building those simpler systems by today's standards, maybe they certainly weren't simple at the time. Um, I think that often the, the people that were actually doing the work were doing this in the kind of way that we're more likely to recognize mm. as being mm. good under the mm. covers of one of these more yeah. bureaucratic you know, approaches. There's a lovely quote from Margaret Hamilton, the, the first software engineer who led the team to build the Apollo guidance system software. Um, and um, she, they were doing complex things with inertial navigation for the first time and a computer that the astronauts could could use that you know has less power than you than, than probably these earbuds let alone let alone your watch or your phone um for the whole thing um and one of the things she said is that you know um, during the time it went from nobody caring about how the complete freedom nobody caring how software was done because nobody thought software was important and so they had complete freedom to bureaucratic overkill when nasa tried to uh, apply you know you know, other, you know aviation style engineering to software and you know her team was spent all of their time trying to fend off the bureaucratic overkill and i think that's how my experience, my experience of working in those kind of big, more bureaucratic approaches was that if you, if you were on a good team, you get good people, then they'd still get stuff done. But they did it by breaking the rules of the, the process because the rules of the process didn't help and got in the way. Um, the, the, um, yeah, it's, it, I, 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 I think that one of the ways that i've characterized the the, the 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 kind of problem that i think that you're talking about in the past is as is, is as a paradigm shift i think that what we are talking about is genuinely a paradigm shift and part of the problem with a paradigm shift is that the rules change and so mm. the rules in the new paradigm look completely alien to the old one and mm. the rules in the old paradigm don't hold for the new one so if you try and apply the rules of the old paradigm like you know, tell me who's going to be working on this feature in six months' time or when's it going to be ready exactly, you know, and let's fix the time and the scope. You know, those rules don't apply. They, they don't work. They, 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 don't, they don't apply to software, and or mm. at least as we understand it. And so you can't really have a conversation. I, I, I think at the conference that I mentioned in my in intro for you, the, the first pipeline conference, I did a talk on... Um, continuous delivery and one of the things that i said there the the, the the subtitle for that talk was that you know, what does good look like because i think that a, a huge part of the industry have never seen what a good mm. software project looks like and that's a terrifying idea but i think it's true and so well-intentioned smart people are doing the wrong things in those mm. organizations it's not that they're evil but they're wrong and then you talked about some of the people that have been pushing that push back against team topologies. You know, you get some people that are making some money from the the big kind of you know paper over the cracks agile processes that that that, that are applied in those big organisations because they're more amenable to what big organisation thinks agile is, but they're not agile in any sense that the founders or anybody that really practices it would recognise. Yeah, exactly. And and I think it's because it's partly because I guess the business world until fairly recently didn't really have the, the terminology and awareness to talk yes. about this stuff. Now that is changing. You've got books like Team of Teams by General Stanley McChrystal, uh, mm -hmm. formerly of the US Marines, I think, or US Army at least, yep. uh, talking about how, how the US Army changed its, had to change itself when it was operating out in the Middle East. Um, and similar kind of books um, empowered by Marty Kagan. People, uh, people have written books like this, which are now getting some traction. And, and, and Team Topology is, is kind of sits in that kind of group uh, to yeah. an extent as well. Um, so, the, the, so some of these ideas are now per, uh, kind of permeating into the world of business, if you like. People who are not technologists. And, are, and those people are starting to become much more aware and have the confidence to be able to to say we are going to go down this route because well ultimately in many cases it's the it's the survival route because yes. if we don't go down this route then we are 
not going to be here in five years time i mean yes. we, we so we we were speaking to a uh to an organization in the kind of banking and financial services space uh, last week and they came to us because it's it's about survival they their their market share has yes. been eaten by by fintech startups and they're worried about getting increasingly cumbersome and sluggish as they get bigger and it's like well we're, this this that's a fairly strong driver for making some changes but the kind of changes yes. that, that that are needed are very unfamiliar yes. and, and and they don't necessarily have the people in the organization who can who can articulate the 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 the, the principles at all or well enough to be able to kind of make that change happen so yeah and and that that's an interesting problem in its own right of being able to find ways of expressing these uh, you and i've been nerding out a little bit in this conversation there's some reasonably deep ideas in, in in here you've got to be able to express these in a way i don't mean i don't mean this to sound condescending but you've got to express it in a way that they're more consumable they're, they're, they're easier yeah. to kind of take on and understand and I, I think that one of the mistakes that we technologists have made for a very long time is not engaging at that level and not engaging in having the conversation in terms that matter to people who aren't technical because these things do matter and you know if we are right and I'm convinced like you that we are that this is actually what works then um, this matters. This is a survival uh, matter for many organisations. And if people don't start to think about the way in which organisations are structured and managed and, you know, uh, uh, organised, they're not going to make it, the, the, the bigger organisations. Like, immediately before the pandemic, I, 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 you know, one of the things that I was observing was visiting big banks, so, you know, you'd go to a big bank and they'd send me to the special location that they'd hived off a bunch of specialist teams to be more agile. And they'd, they'd have, you know, free Coca-Cola and whiteboards on the walls and all that kind of stuff to try and get some of the trappings of being, you know, more like a startup and more agile to try and solve this problem because they knew that the the big corporate approach wasn't working. I'm not quite sure how that's translated following the pandemic you know, uh, diaspora, but mm -hmm. uh, but um, certainly that was a feature immediately before. Yeah, that's got, yeah, banks and and other organisations, telecoms organisations, yeah. and other big like, insurance places, that often have like a digital yeah division. Yes. I don't know why it's called digital because all the stuff is digital. In the software, <laughs> but anyway, let's ignore that. It's, it's, I know it's the digital channel. It's the digital channel for consumers, but. Um, and this was allowed to do things, you know, that, that division allowed to, allowed to do things slightly differently and so on and so on. But um, in many organizations, there was this effective fight between the traditional and the so-called digital. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes yeah. the traditional would win and basically uh, block all the stuff that this 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 cowboy digital division is doing. Yeah. Completely misunderstanding what's going on. And this is still happening, I, I think. And unfortunately, you, you're gonna, we're going to see what well, we are seeing organizations fold and um effectively fail or or slowly fail as they yeah. bleed customers or, or accounts to um to competitors who are able to do have a way of working uh, an operating a set of operating principles which is which is yeah it, which expects change and um, at its very center expects things to change and does not need fixed deadlines and certainty about every single thing uh, uh, the whole operating model is 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 fundamentally different yeah we, we we were talking before we started actually recording you and i about the kind of different models of response to popular ideas uh, that we get you, you get the you get the fans and you get the haters and you yeah. you get the, you know, the the people that just you know just misunderstand it uh, and and a few others but but i think one one of the groups that that that, that seems um interesting to me are the people that just um seem to seem to just completely miss the point and seem to focus on the the, the wrong outcomes I've lost my train of thought. That's, that's not good, is it? <laughs> well, I mean, some some of those some of those people are sort of doing it deliberately because they're they're they've got an axe to grind or they they've got some training to sell. Um, other people are have just are coming from a very different mindset, and so for them, 
the, yeah, for, for them, the ideas are, are baffling. Yes. And so they, la they latch on to some surface level aspects of, of, of whatever it is we're talking about. Um, and fundamentally miss the, miss the kind of heuristics or, or clues or decision principles behind the approach. Yeah. And so completely misinterpret it, but kind of accidentally. There's a mixture of, of people doing doing different different kind of accidental or deliberate misinterpretation. Yes, yes. Yeah. So let's 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 move on a little bit mm. more. So 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 you know, I, following on from that though. So so team topologies is a very different way for many organisations to think about teams. And one of the aspects it seems to me that it recognises in the model is something that that I kind of perceive is, is that the modern effective approach to organising software development at any kind of scale is really um, about taking a more distributed approach, I think. We're trying to organise, uh, structure our organisation in ways that we can have smaller, more modular teams with greater autonomy that can kind of be you know, to some degree in charge of their own destiny. They can they can kind of make changes. They can kind of, you know, figure out what they need to do to solve the problems without having to coordinate and collaborate with other people in order to achieve that. And that's one of the, you know, the, the kind of defining characteristics that the Accelerate research and book mm. you know, pointed to, that the, yep. that's, that's how, what high-performance teams mm. look like. So how do we, you know, in these organizations that are kind of trying to make the move and make this transition, the tough thing, it seems to me, to be able to do that is this is significantly, from the perspective of an old school leader or manager in an organization like that, it's significantly about release, seemingly feeling that they're going to relax control. They're going to delegate that control to members of the team. That's the right thing to do, I think, that you and I would both say. So, yes. So, would, um, would you say that? And how? How? What advice would you have for people in those sorts of situations? Um, so, it, it is and is not about relinquishing control. Um, if you, if you, again, if your model is a mechanism, then, uh, but it's still a mechanism. So, let's say you might have seen some of these old clocks that exist in parts of in parts of continental Europe. And it, is, it has, has the phases of the moon. It has the sun going around, and it, and, it, and it has little characters that come out when it strikes the hour. And you know the mechanism is just amazing, like really detailed. But it's still a mechanism. Mm -hmm. It's still absolutely predictable what is going to happen when you wind up that mechanism, and when it starts, when the clock starts ticking. Um, and so, at a certain scale, a certain small scale, it's possible for a leader to still control all aspects of that mechanism. Um, and that, you know, and throughout the 20th century, we could sort of more or less pretend that things were mechanistic in terms of how things work. As soon as we've got, um, well, first it first came telephony, so the telephones, that, that, that started to screw things up a bit for, for that kind of mechanistic approach. And then certainly with the internet, where speed of it's not just about people to people communication, but of course machine to machine communication, being able to go much 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 more quickly. Any illusion about about a single leader being able to control anything small, anything larger than something tiny, really, it just goes out the window. A leader cannot have that degree of control, and it's the wrong control approach fundamentally because the the environment that we're operating in. Um, has too many degrees of freedom to be able to specify a machine that can operate effectively in that kind of space. Mm -hmm. And so, it's, again, it's a fundamental misunderstanding about the, the operating context, the idea that we can control everything. Um, and so what we need to do instead is to um, distribute uh, decision making at a local level or across the organization actually across the different different levels of the organization just different ways but crucially have decision making at the what we call the nodes so the very tips of of this kind of um, yeah. network of of people and information 
so that for certain kinds of decisions, those nodes are empowered to to make some sort of them kind of changes. I, I, I'm when we talk about this in Teams Bodies book, I'm I have in mind an insect or a colony of insects because the insects there have got antenna and they can sense their world and they can they can make changes that they can make decisions they can they can change direction we don't have you know in an ant colony you do not have the queen ant uh, directly controlling all of the all of the other ants it just wouldn't work it's it's too complicated and you wouldn't want that because you need uh you need a variety of responses in this in this operating environment which is quite rich you can't possibly have one it's, it's actually also a single point of failure because if that operating if that single yeah. operating um entity has never seen a particular context before then does it does it does it lock up does it do something wrong what you want is to be able to distribute that and ex and explicitly you want to be able to learn from multiple different things happening inside this kind of environment bring that information back in and go ah oh, that's really interesting we've never seen that before but hey we've we've discovered a suitable response to this thing because we've empowered that node or that group of people to 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 to, to, to respond in a suitable way mm -hmm. and so that the thing about distributing control is is about recognizing that we're operating in uh an unpredictable operating context and therefore we need to have very we need to empower local decision making informed by um kind of mission like what is the mission of the organization in general and also in this particular area or for this particular day or, or the next few weeks um so it's the so it becomes the it becomes important for leadership to be very clear about mission and and things to look out for when these other teams and departments are operating, but then let but hire good people, train them well, and let them get on with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And kind of get out of the way, enable these other departments and teams and, and, and people to operate in a way which is safe to operate in that way. So guardrails and and principles, potentially even checklists. Yeah, if, if that's the right thing to do, and and then make sure we're getting good feedback. To inform our decision making and work out when when our maybe mission was not quite articulated well, yeah, and therefore we'll work out ways to articulate it better. Like again, it's, it's it, this this assumption that we can control everything comes from uh, a completely different operating context, which is which is much simpler and therefore yeah. is not at all suitable for um, a modern uh, uh, kind of internet connected information dense world that we find ourselves in now yes yeah 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 and that um that i the idea of of kind of the distributed intelligence in the organization it seems very very central to i think the way that both you and i would think about what's going on in in, in bigger teams and be, being able to do you know being able to take advantage of that and one of the things that I think that the you know the people on the other side of the debate miss is that this is a very disciplined approach. It's just distributed discipline and distributed decision making. It's not that it's a cowboy approach where everybody's just laissez faire. The, 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 you talked about you know, guide rails and you, you know we, we we adopt you know those lines and you know we we we, we use that those those structures to help. Keep give keep us in a, an area where we can kind of exercise our autonomy and and, and so on and, and that's it's it's a very different thing but it, it it seems difficult to sometimes difficult to to describe to people that haven't seen it in operation. Mm. Um, I, I, I think that I think that's changing though. I, I mean I mean mm. that you know that the team to follow the. One of the reasons why I love the Team Topologies book so much is that it re, you know, like any book that we that we like, it reinforced a lot of opinions that I held. But one of the things that it does is it gives us some of that structure, some of those organizing ways of expressing ideas and understanding them better and using them as tools. So we can talk, we've got a we've got a nomen, you know, at the very limit least, we've got a nomenclature now 
that we can use. And I, I've adopted that as my nomenclature for these things. I used to talk differently about some of these ideas, but now I use your and Manuel's mm. um, nomenclature exclusively. And, uh, you know, that helps. Those things help. It, it, that, it helps move the game on. And it helps mm. us to structure more about going forwards. But again, going back to this person who hasn't yet seen the light and he's still thinking in more traditional terms, what are the ways that you have seen that kind of help them to start? Well, first, you can give them a copy of your book. <laughs> but, uh, but, but what are the ways that you've seen that help them to start maybe seeing that there are some other ways of looking at things? It's, it's a really good question. The, um, so what we tend to do is, so we, 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 for example, we, we run workshops for, for exec, uh, exec teams or, or C-level groups, managers and so on, to help them get their head around, um, to, get them, to help them get their head around kind of this, this new mental model and, and specifically around what we call fast flow. So literally on, on the front cover of the Teams Bodies book, it says organizing business and technology teams for fast flow. Yeah. And that's important because yeah. if, if, if you're in a context which is not about fast, excuse me, sorry, not, not about fast flow, then some of the, some of the Teams Bodies stuff is less relevant. Not all. I mean, there's, there's some which is applicable, we think, in pretty much yeah. any context, but some of it is less relevant and that's fine. Um, but yeah, I mean, f fast flow, uh, you know, continuous delivery itself is in the context of fast flow, really. Yeah. Like if, if, if we had all the time in the world and we didn't care about making changes and we could go really slowly, we might not use continuous delivery. That's fine. I mean, we probably would, you and I would, but that's a, <laughs> se 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 a separate thing. The, the, the need for it might not be so apparent, but um, practices like you know, kind of SRE, practices like um, uh, post-incident review, things like psychological safety, yeah. all of these things together, they're really needed because we're actually going at pace and we're going, yeah. well, at scale and at pace. So we've got this sense of fast flow. And so so we run some workshops and, and one of the things that seems to be really helpful is to get people uh, to kind of step outside their current way of thinking. So set up a scenario that says, um, we've got a team that does not hand off to any other team at all. They, 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 they look after a, a, a one or two services, perhaps, or one or two flows of change, or maybe one or two user journeys, and they do not need to hand off to anyone else to do anything. What would it take to make that work? Mm -hmm. And they go, well, well, there's a load of stuff they wouldn't be able to do. They wouldn't be able to deal with security. They wouldn't be able to deal with all of the complicated cloud technologies. Yeah. Um, blah, blah. And effectively, they, they, they come up with the core principles from the Teams Boardings book because that's, yes. that was our starting point as well. And it's kind of fun to see that emerge. And, and they go, and they list all this stuff out and go, yeah, that sounds pretty good. Yeah, like, so, so what would you call this collection of things that allows them to self-serve <laughs> on, 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 on security or on deployments? Oh, we could call that like a platform, for example. Oh, okay, let's call it that. And so on and so on. And effectively, they end up, what emerges often is the, the core kind of team to these ideas, which is great because then they've effectively written, written it themselves. So, so starting was... from first principles and gu guiding them through it, and kind of asking a few cheeky questions here and there to, to shape the shape the conversation a bit, but it, it's it's a really powerful way for people to experience the lots of light bulb moments, and at that point they go, ah, not everyone, but many yeah. people go, ah, you have this, <laughs> a series of aha moments, and then you, they're, then then they're in a very different mindset, and it's difficult to, to to go away from that. So, so what you're saying is that you and Manuel aren't as smart as we all thought you were. <laughs> oh, I'm sure I'm, I've got loads, I've got loads and loads and loads to learn. I've got loads and loads to learn. No, 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 no. That's that's that, that's that, that's 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 great, and 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 it is such a it's such a uh, a fantastic idea. I, 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 we're we're kind of coming towards wrap up time but before we get there i wanted to talk a little bit about what i think is a new, your new book which is about working remotely we, we've all to some degree been forced into more remote working remote remote working so the team yep. topologies thing i can see ways in which it still matters but i can also see ways that make you know remote working more 
tricky, harder. Uh, and I, I watched some stuff. I watched a video of yours where, where you and Manuel were kind of playing off again, doing some kind of role play, show, show, showing it working yep. a, a, a little bit. And um, I, I thought that was really good. Uh, but can you just describe a little bit as, about, you know, what changes when we're starting to apply some of this style of thinking to, to remote working? Yeah, sure. So the book is this one here. For those of you watching the, uh, the video, Remote Team Interactions Workbook. The subtitle is Using Team Topologies Patterns for Remote Working. Um, the Team Topologies book was published September 2019. That was obviously just a few months before the COVID-19 pandemic started. Um, so in the Team Topologies book, we, we've got some stuff that talks about like physical desk locations and things like that. Now, that's still relevant to those people who are in offices, but there's a bunch of stuff which which is which is um, not explicitly called out for, for remote working. So that's what we did with the with the workbook. <clears throat> um, and actually, it turns out that a, a, a big chunk of the team to body, in fact, most of the, the stuff in team to body is, is basically directly applicable to, to yeah. remote working context, because a lot of what team to body is about, if you look at it closely, is about, as you said, terminology or nomenclature, uh, terminology, um, and patterns for thinking about the interactions between teams yeah. and therefore the interactions between software and about decoupling things like this. Yeah. And um, yes, if we're in a physical office, we might want to create a team area that then has a kind of boundary, a, 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 a something of a boundary around it, probably not a doorway on the end. Mm -hmm. So we've got a kind it's not, it's not completely closed off from, from all other people, but but it's somewhat decoupled from other people. We've got some of those, I don't know what you call them, like like um, like whiteboards or barriers between different teams, something like that. Yeah. Fine. So how does that apply in the remote work context? Well, let's try and define what the team is. How do people find who is in our team? What's the purpose of the team? And so on and so on. And how, how, do, they, how do they go about finding that inside a chat tool like Slack? Yeah. And so what we're doing is taking ideas from Team to Body's book, including t uh, ideas like the Team API, which is itself like a super nerdy technical term, application programming interface API, and applying that to a team. Yeah. Um, and therefore, in the remote work, remote work context, how can other teams discover, self-discover, the Team API for other teams and look yeah. at that and use that in a useful way to help them reason about the intent of their team, the intent of another team to help them think, okay, uh, how should we be interacting with this team and so on and so on. Yeah. Um, a lot of it is about expectation. If, there's a great book called um, uh, Thinking in Promises mm -hmm. um, by, uh, by Mark Burgess, who's a mathematician, but has come up with this, uh, well, has developed, promise theory and it's actually relatively straightforward but it's exploring this this dynamic about what happens if one group is promising something to someone else mm -hmm. and also I mean, obviously we've got the idea of a promise in some programming languages which which is not quite the same thing but but closely related if if we can specify our expectations of other teams we can have a, a much more fruitful conversation mm -hmm. And if we can do that in a way which uses remote tools like a wiki or like Slack or something else like this allows us to find find these kind of specifications and expectations or semi-automatically or by a search, then we've already had to do a lot of the thinking, which avoids lots of the wasteful, you know, online meetings that we would otherwise yeah. have. Yeah. So we're doing a lot of this thinking, we're doing a lot of this untangling that we talked about before. We're doing that by using these concepts like team API and yeah. the, the teams bodies, team types and team interaction modes and things. Uh, to, so that we're untangling lots of these concepts and we can have a much more fruitful and, and, and meaningful kind of conversation with other people. We're, we're, we're putting, some, putting in some terminology and some, some patterns to enable much more, uh, well, to enable more coherent behavior to emerge. That's actually yes. what's happening. Yes. So one one of the takes that I got from I haven't read I haven't read the book yet. Um, I, I, I will I'll buy it when we're finished. <laughs> but uh, but the um, 
one of the things that I got from the the snippet that I watched on 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 the the example that you were going through was that it's very some of the advice is very practical. You, 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 the exercise that I saw, you were, you were, you were identifying that you know Slack channels were were, were poorly named, and and so it wasn't easy for other people to discover mm. what I presume you know part of this API for for a team is, and, and those sorts of things in terms of thinking in those information terms to come up with you know mm. navigable, discoverable information about the team structure and organizational structure, and the you know the ways to communicate effectively are, are, are just just valuable stuff that, that that so many people often don't think about completely and, and i would definitely say look that there's nothing magic in the, in this workbook it, it, it's actually pretty straightforward and 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 um we we we're, we're and it's called a workbook because precisely because it's about putting things into practice it's super super yeah. practical um it, it's it's about yeah. It's it's some ideas for effectively constraining how we use online tools. Yeah. For some people, that sounds really strange. We should be able to use the tools however we want. Well, maybe, but that's not how the world works with biology. No. The biology is constrained, very very strongly constrained by by lots of, in lots of different ways with DNA and with how message, chemical messaging works and, and how neurotransmitters work and all sorts of things. There are lots of constraints, but that allows amazing behavior to emerge and yes. amazing designs to emerge and so by putting some constraints in place using some online tools then we can have much more a much richer and much more straightforward kind of remote way of working precisely because we've constrained it yes yeah absolutely and i i i think i think that's deeply that's a deeply important and often missed ideas I, one of my more successful videos on my youtube channel was about you know, pitching oo against functional programming and i i i based some of the analysis on a model that um, bob martin has of um characterizing the different programming paradigms by the constraints that they place on programming and I think it's quite a good model, I, 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 and I, I, I've, I've thought a little bit about that since. And you know, one of the things that that I've started to ideas that I've started to riff on recently is, you know, in te- I'm thinking about what software engineering means as as a discipline, is that what engineering is really about is about the constraints. It's not mm. about saying, "Here's the answer." Ever. It never predefines mm. the solution. What it does is it places constraints that rules out all the dumb solutions, so or, or, all the one, all the dumb solutions that we know about so far, at least. So there, we kind of ad- adopt those constraints as kind of a working discipline, and that will give us a higher chance of hitting one of the solutions that isn't dumb. And, and I think that's. I think that's saying something similar to what you're describing. Yeah, yeah. and, and instant, instantly, exactly the same thing applies if we uh, if we use um, like artificial neural networks to design things. Mm-hmm. So, you, so we're using neural networks to design uh, airplane wings and and, um, and 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 kind of uh, other kind of um, high stress components. And the designs that come out look really weird. They look biological. Yeah. because they don't have straight lines and all we've done in this i mean it's a little bit more involved than this but in principle all it's done all we've done is apply some constraints say so we here's the here's the weight here's the size here's a few other things and uh here's how much load it needs to bear and allow the neural network or other kind of um supervised learning type um software to come up with with a design but that, that's what we're really talking about it, it's yes. engineering we're still engineering there yeah. It's not humans doing that stuff by hand. It's, yeah. it, but it, it's setting some constraints and allowing that the, the the right design to, or a useful design that meets those constraints to emerge. Um, so yeah, I, I totally it, it it applies even in situations where humans are not directly involved in in, in all the yeah, aspects yeah. Of, of what that design looks like. So in summary, then I think that what we're both saying is that engineering is king, and our job in soft in software develop development is to find ways to harness it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that'll do <laughs> great uh, it's probably time that we should start uh, wrapping up i i, I want to thank thank you matthew for, for for taking part today it's been a 
I've really enjoyed the conversation. I, I, yeah, I, 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 I like this kind of you know intell yeah. intellectual riffing a little bit. It's 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 an mm -hmm. awful lot of fun. I, I hope that people have enjoyed watching it. Um, check out on Matt if you haven't yet bought. Team Topologies, what on earth are you doing? Go and <laughs> go to Amazon or to your favorite bookshop right now and buy it a looks copy. Like this. It, looks it looks like, like this. It and it like is, I, I genuinely believe this is one of the more influential, important books that's happened in software development for some time. It looks at things from a very different perspective and starts to help us to bridge the gap. Uh, in, in in certainly in larger organisations, but but any team beyond any organisations that are building software with more than one team, this stuff matters. Um, yeah. So 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 do take a look at that. Um, I'll wrap up by saying thank you as ever for watching today. Uh, if you enjoyed the content on the channel, do consider joining our community over at Patreon. Patreon, go to Patreon and check out. Look for continuous delivery. You'll find us. And once again, thanks to Matthew and goodbye to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Doug.